What's up guys, this is Corey um, coming at you from the Eclipse National Sales Meeting. I guess this year it's technically a premium audio company. Uh, Eclipse has actually expanded into uh, the distributor world with this new venture. Basically, you know, there's all kinds of stuff going on with Onkyo and Yamo, Magnat, I think, uh, Pioneer, Integra, all kinds of fun stuff going on. So. We'll be learning about all of that over the next few days. We wanted to squeeze in a preseason um, special video to show you the new Jubilees. These are the new ones that are just coming out. These are not the ones that have been available since around, what, 2002, 2003. These are the Jubilees. The original ones have been dubbed the Underground Jubilees at this point. These have not been released yet. Nobody knows about them. We can't release this until next week. So I'm hoping at least come Monday, maybe Wednesday, November 1st, maybe the 3rd, uh, you'll get to see this video. And um, we're, we're trying our best to have the first uh, videos out. Um, in terms of the rest of the channel, on November 6th, we'll be launching season two. We've got several fun ideas. Be sure to subscribe and uh, stay tuned for that. In the meantime, we want to show you these beasts. At this point, you know, I've got more exposure to these than any other dealer that I'm aware of. We actually, um, we came before last, we just spent a couple of days at Hope, two days straight talking to Roy, listening to the Jubes, asking any question we possibly could. We went to the lab, it was all kinds of good stuff. I will share some pictures in this video. So. Um, if you want to know the history on this, we've got another video that gets you up to speed. There's all kinds of aspects to the Jubilees that are a little bit different than your typical speaker, and that is still the deal with the old ones, the professional. At this point, they're calling those the underground Jubilees. These are just the Jubilees. Uh, I've been calling them the heritage versus professional but I guess Roy likes the, uh, the, the underground uh, aspect. So anyways, these are just ginormous. These are, these are not your typical speakers. They're all about performance. So um, even the old ones, you know, the sound stages are gonna be huge. The reason they were created in the first place is to get this super clean uh, bass bin response. Um, the whole idea in this, you know, again, watch, watch the history video, but basically the whole idea of the Jubilee to begin with was um, Paul Klipsch wanted to take the Klipsch horn back to a two-way design. So basically these are, were originally intended to be the, the replacement of the Klipsch horn. Once they existed, um, Paul decided they're like next level. He didn't want to replace them. So he just kind of made their own product. That's where, you know, the whole Jubilee came from. So um, anyways, I, I don't know how to explain all the technical aspects other than just we're gonna start from the top and we're gonna go to the bottom. I'll explain all of the DSP, everything else. So first things first, this 402 horn. Of course, the old ones, um, you know, they, they look funny. They're, I hate to use the word ugly, but they're very utilitarian. So uh, these are actually the same horns, this, this 402 horn uh, that you see here. Um, they did pretty it up. Uh, I've always told Roy that I think prettying up the 402 horn is like putting lipstick on a pig, but they did do a very good job with this. You just notice it's, it's very simple. Um, I've, I've seen all kinds of stuff done. I've seen grills, I've seen borders, I've seen, you know, little stainless steel um, borders. Some of them look good, some of them not so much. This is about as simple yet elegant as, as it gets. The other thing I really like, this really sets it off, this whole painting of the 402 horn. So basically, by default, when you get a raw 402 horn, it, it's all kinds of splotchy. It, there's, there's nothing pretty about the finish at all. So they basically, it took them about 10 tries. Um, they basically, you know, found a combination that works and it just, the paint alone looks incredible. <clears throat> they actually um, put that on the back as well. So that, it doesn't sound like much, but yeah, I was really surprised to see the paint. 
And of course, the other big thing that's the biggest difference is the driver, who we'll, we'll share some pictures. This is actually a Celestion AXI 2050. I was told they did not do anything special. Sometimes clips, um, they'll take a driver and they'll say, well, we like it, but we want to harden the dome or any number of things. This is just straight up AXI 2050, so you can read about that. However, um, it's, it's not exactly the same as just taking that driver and bolting it to big horn, mainly because of this phase plug right here. It's a 50 cent part or something. That's where all the magic is. So basically what, in layman's terms, it's, it's gonna be spreading the sound out. Just looking at it, it's, it's just, it's, it's a whole bunch of little circles. It, it doesn't look like much, but when you hear things on this 402 horn, such as a snare drum, it, it sounds huge. Compared to the old one, you know, it sounds like snares are just coming from a little three inch circle. This thing just sounds ginormous. And the other thing that the phase plug does is blend the things. The other, the other aspect about the old ones that uh, wasn't the coolest thing is that um, basically you could, especially if you sit kind of close to it, uh, you can kind of tell that you know, some sounds were coming from the 402, some sounds were coming from the bass bin. With these, um, you know, the imaging is more like riding the middle. It, it just, everything blends quite a bit better. The other thing that is directly related to the phase plug is the coverage pattern. The old one, uh, you've basically got about a 50, 50 degree coverage pattern. This is between 80 and 90, the frequency dependent, but just the dispersion is, is much wider and that is totally because of that little 50 cent part. This compression driver is actually, it, it's huge. I, I thought the old one was like the K691, which is a BNC DE75. I thought that was huge. These new ones are, are, are ginormous. One thing I did like about it is that they actually have you know, normal speaker terminals now. The old ones, you had to like take a, um, you know, take some wire, strip it out, sh you know, shove it in the terminals. It wasn't the coolest thing ever when you're dealing with uh, people who want to use expensive speaker wires. So we'll show you the new terminals. But yeah, now basically you just plug your banana plugs into the back of it and there's a jumper wire that's going to go up to the top. On the, the base bin, the, the biggest thing that you're going to notice is just the low extension. Uh, it, it's everything, absolutely everything you listen to is, is just much fuller. Um, of course, most people, even with the old one, they're not going to use the subwoofer, which is leaving a lot of bass on the table. There's some guys who run a sub, but unless you've got something that's the best of the best, you know, it doesn't necessarily blend all that well. So basically, these are flat down to 18 hertz. I was skeptical when I, you know, read about it, but they, they, they will surprise you. These grills, you've got a choice, you know, these are going to be magnetic. You can put that on or you can leave it off. So the old ones were, you know, the old ones were typically like this. We had a couple of guys who, you know, tried to put a grill on it, but uh, these are factory, just like that. It's magnetic, super simple. So you probably notice the size. These are significantly wider. Um, supposedly, you know, the width, I mean, the depth isn't all that different. The height, really the only difference in height is because of these footers right here. Uh, these actually make it look pretty majestic. And if you put them side by side, the height is very similar. The old ones actually come up to, you know, maybe right there. Um, just looking at them, you would think that they're much taller, but they're just not. Um, they're going to be about 30 inches wide. Um, you know, Roy was saying, him and Paul were talking, and, you know, Paul said, well, if you can't fit it in the door, who cares? So, um, you know, the width was a, supposedly a significant uh, design consideration. Of course, just getting them in the door due to the sheer weight is still gonna be an issue, but they should fit through a standard modern door. Uh, some of your old doors that are more like 28 inches, you know, may, you may have trouble, but uh, most doors nowadays, it, it should fit right in. 
So yeah, the, the weight of these, supposedly all together, these are about 340 pounds. Just the basement alone is uh, 280. So um, you just get them in the door, basically two guys are probably gonna have to do it. That's gonna, that's gonna be tough. So just, just be prepared. One thing about the beauty panel is you probably can't tell them much unless they were side by side, but basically these beauty panels are a little bit wider, or a little bit narrower. So supposedly that, um, you know, helps with the sound. Just looking at it from memory, it, it, it looks about the same. But yeah, another thing you'll notice is that this whole thing was cut out of a single sheet of wood. So any design, any effects in the veneer is gonna go all the way up. So um, it supposedly the way that they cut it out was actually pretty efficient as well, so that there's not a lot of waste. You know, just looking at it, you'd think that uh, the way they cut it, they'd have to scrap a ton of wood, but supposedly they did a good job. The biggest thing you'll notice about this is the it, the lower extension. And what I couldn't wrap my head around is the, the idea that you could get twice as low, um, basically we're below 20 hertz at this point, but without getting a horn that is much larger. So supposedly it's all about the flare rate. Um, the horn is a little bit bigger, uh, but not much. Also, basically, this is moving to a vented design. Um, so they started with a single woofer, it was vented, and we're basically trying to wrap a horn around the whole thing. Um, to bump up the efficiency closer to the, the original Jubilee, they squeezed in a second woofer, which I thought was interesting because when they did so, the they ran impedance curves on it. The tuning didn't change. They they totally expected the tuning to change, and uh, you know basically Roy's just got a couple of helpers in the lab. Once they actually put it together, ran an impedance curve, it was the same. So Roy actually got some of his friends on the phone. One guy's he's been got a master's in acoustics with a he's a subwoofer genius, and you know they're trying to figure out what's going on and what they did wrong, but apparently. There's nothing wrong, it just, it works like that. And so um, there's really, you can't really model this stuff. It was, it was a lot of experimentation, which I thought was interesting. Uh, this, the design actually goes back to Roy had that idea, probably in 1999. Um, they just kind of put it on the shelf for quite a while. It's just now seen the light of day, but I'm pretty sure there's patents that go back to the late 90s. As I mentioned before, uh, wiring management is, is much better. On the back of the base bin is basically where you, all of your wires are going to. The old one, you could use bare wire with it, but that's about it. Uh, it wouldn't even fit a spade. You could get a typical audio file grade spade. Uh, it was actually too wide. So uh, a lot of guys were disappointed about that. They had these, you know, in-game speakers and they got, got to use bare wire. So the new ones, you know, if you want to go crazy, get some super nice. Banana plugs, it just plugs right in. Like I mentioned earlier, basically there's a jumper that goes up to the compression driver. It's just much cleaner than usual. So the DSP, this is where the magic is. The old one was actually based on a Zillica unit, which a lot of people have never heard of, but it, it's actually a very high quality unit. Uh, it, it's actually the same exact unit that uh, Legacy originally used on the Aeris system. So um, the problem with that is that it wasn't the most user-friendly uh, or pretty thing in the world. Basically, um, people could get into it and jack around, change the curve how they wanted, which was good and bad. But uh, the new one, it, it takes all of that away. You can't get in the unit. It looks it looks really sharp. You've just got you know clean silver across the front. It's got a nice little wood top. Uh, one thing that we were concerned about was the, the gain structure, I mean, but basically the gain on these things is going to be on the front. You've got one big knob for the base bin, you've got a smaller knob for the treble. So what that lets you do is if you've got two different amps, let's say you want to use um, tubes on top, you want to use solid state on the bottom, 
you know, maybe the bottom has XLRs, top has RCA only. That's not a problem with this. You could just plug it right in. They've got RCA and XLRs on the back. Like I said, they've got gain on the front. So um, it, it should be dummy head proof, or like Rabori would say, bonehead proof. There was rumors going around quite a while that uh, these new ones may be um, passive, but of course, that is completely off the table at this point. It, it's gonna be active. Originally, the reason they did that is because you could smooth out the basement. Um, there was several little quirks about the original basement, and by using an active DSP, active crossover, they were able to smooth that out. You could do it with a passive, but it ends up being so complex. Plus, you've got the delay. Uh, you know, you've got to delay um, the 402. By the time you're done with the, your, you know, to do it right, a, a passive crossover would just be ridiculous in complexity. Uh, I mentioned the wood top. Most people are going to use it like that. They're going to put the unit down, they're going to put the wood top on. Uh, that should match your speakers. I think they're going to have different colors. Uh, the one that's in here now is basically walnut. It's going to match this. Um, of course, a black one is coming out as well. So I'm pretty sure the black is going to match uh, the speakers. What you can do, though, is just pop that top right off and just shove it in your rack. Uh, it's going to have rack ears, so you can put it, you know, in a typical server style rack and it should look very clean. So what all does this mean in terms of what you're hearing? Um, so basically, like I mentioned before, the most uh, obvious thing you're going to hear is the low extension. Uh, this thing, I mean, 1820 hertz is, is no problem. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, that was shocking. Um, when we listen to all the demo equipment, like at, at Hope, uh, one of my favorite tracks to listen to is uh, Paul Simon and Diamond on, Diamonds on the Soles of Her Shoes. That song, just the drum fills, um, it, it, the attack was just so enveloping. It, it's, uh, I just kept cranking and cranking. It's like you couldn't make the things loud enough. Um, that was that was really fun. Uh, another one that I tend to use is Tedeschi Trucks Band, Midnight in Harlem, just because I like going to see Derek Trucks live. I know what his um, guitar sounds like. You can listen to that song on most anything, and, it, and it's pleasant. You can walk down, you can go down the road uh, in your car. It's pleasant enough. If you want to reproduce what it actually sounds like live, that's a different story. And these were super fun hearing that. Of course, some of the other Clips Professional uh, speakers is, is got that same, you know, gritty uh, live sound. Um, other one I tend to use is uh, Gillian Welch, mainly because her voice is just really raw. It's not over-processed whatsoever. You can put that song in. It just—it sounds like it's in the room. She's in the same room with you. So um, we listen to those. Um, one song that keeps getting repeated quite a bit is "Tool," uh, "Invincible." That it, it's almost like these were made for Tool. Um, even setting off axes, the vocals, uh, just the sound stage is ginormous. All of the little um, harmonics that you hear from the bass guitar is it just comes through loud and clear, but the drums is the biggest thing. These are absolutely the best drum machine I've ever heard. Just the attack, like I mentioned earlier. Um, you just want to keep cranking and cranking, which is good and bad. I say bad because these could potentially be dangerous. Uh, basically, there's it's so clean, there's so low distortion that you, your ears don't have the same warning signs as, as usual. Typically, if you crank up a speaker that sounds like trash, you get to a certain point and it's like, oh, I better turn these down, they're hurting my ears. These aren't quite the same. You just keep getting louder and louder. You just don't have that same warning sign. So um, that would be the biggest thing I would tell potential customers is that you know keep an eye on your SPL and don't get too carried away because it's it's super easy to do with these things.
I mentioned drums. Um, with the attack, you know, I'm, I've basically got toms, floor toms, that kind of thing in mind. Um, Kick drums is another big thing. A lot of people don't realize that kick drums aren't just the 63 hertz bump. I mean, basically that original snap of the beater on the skin, um, that snap is gonna originate about two kilohertz. And these things, it's just so snappy on these things. Um, but also with this phase plug, when you hear a snare drum, it sounds way more realistic. If you, sound, if you hear the old one, uh, basically the compression driver, it's, it's kind of point source. You can tell that the snare is coming from right here. With these, it's just the snare sounds huge, which is exactly how it sounds live. One song in particular I didn't um, really care for on these is Keith Urban's, I think it's called uh, Blue Ancient Color. That song has a ton of sibilance, which these speakers are going to be extremely revealing. So, and like Roy said, you can't blame the speakers for, uh, you know, bad recording. So, that would, I'm not entirely sure I would be a big vinyl fan on these, um, personally. There, you just, you've got to, if you're going to do some serious listening, it's got to be with some decent recording. This is, is Siblings in particular, that's gonna stand out. So that's about all I can tell you at this point. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed. Be sure to subscribe, stay tuned for uh, up and coming season two. We do have two pair of these on order, uh, one black, one walnut. We should have those at the, uh, at the shop for too long. We will be doing follow-up videos once we can spend some more time in an environment that we can control. So stay tuned for that. We're taking pre-orders on these things. So if you think these are for you, be sure to reach out to myself or Stephen D. Uh, thanks, See, talk to you guys soon. Hey guys, this is Corey again. Just wanted to do a follow-up video while everything was fresh in my mind. Uh, we're wrapping up the national sales meeting for Clips and just what an incredible last couple days. Just really fun. I was really happy to be here. Of, of course, we probably rushed the previous video a little bit. We had a window of opportunity and Roy was setting up the Jubilees, but he was testing and doing a bunch of sound checks and we just tried to squeeze that in there. So hopefully I didn't come across as too nervous either. Uh, Roy was actually in the room watching me and um, I'm just a simple country boy. I, I felt a little out of my element coming here in the first place, but also giving a lecture on Jubilees in front of Roy is like a farmer going to astrophysics convention and Neil Tyson's in the audience. It's just kind of overwhelming. Roy's my friend, but at the same time, like, wow, like, I, the roles should be reversed here. So, anyways, um, yeah, the technical aspects I'll get to in a second, but just while it's on my mind, um, yeah, the, the way that people responded to these things was just really, really positive. A couple of people in particular was very telling. So Pat Lavelle, um, he's the CEO of Vox. He was here as well as Tommy Jacobs. Keep in mind, these guys have lived and breathed high-end audio for years, decades. You know, it, these are titans of the industry. So they've seen a lot of stuff. And just looking around the audience, especially those two guys, they, they literally just closed their eyes and you could tell they were just lost. Uh, and Pat in particular was just, you could, you could just tell he was going to another world. Tommy, he literally said, you know, I just closed my eyes and it was like I was being transcended to another place. I didn't know where that place was. I didn't know where I was going, but I liked it. Like that, that, I thought that was a really powerful statement, but literally everybody just shut up and listened. They were trying to get to the center of the room. Everybody was super excited. Um, of course, uh, Tool in the Invincible song, that just blew people's mind. I and mean, you can hear it, that's one of those songs where it's cool no matter what you listen to. You can listen to it on a $10 set of headphones, it, it's super cool. When you hear it on these, 
it, it's just otherworldly. It, it, it's just, I can't describe it. You can, we'll, we'll back up and just show just how far uh, these things are spread out. The people in the crowd, uh, you know, way back in the room, they were just closing their eyes. The, the sound stage was just, is 15 foot wide. You heard every little harmonic. It, it's just absolutely insane. Um, the Jubilees have imaging like you have never heard. Uh, like, I can't stress that enough. I don't care how many shows you've went to. I don't know how, I don't care how many little towers that you've heard. You have not heard imaging like with these, assuming that they're set up right, assuming that they're in a good room. Clips um, actually sold some to a rep 30 seconds after a demo started. Pat Lavelle I mentioned earlier, I forget the exact wordings, but his, he basically said, I've never heard anything like this in my life. And that's coming from industry titans, you know, that that's just something else. I'm used to, Basically, having a close-knit bunch of friends with the so-called underground jubilees, uh, we've had a lot of fun with them. Those guys know what's up. You know, I'm here. I'm used to hearing statements like that. But these, this crowd, when they've never heard it before, and they were just floored. That that's that's something different. So, a couple of technical details I kind of glossed over uh, the other day. First of all, starting with the compression driver. So this is not your average little, most people think about compression drivers, they're, they're thinking about, you know, this type of size with the RF7 or something. These are ginormous, they look like landmines. Like if you were to take this and half bury it in Bosnia or Russia or something, I mean, they would pass for a landmine, they're just that industrial looking that huge. Um, interesting thing about these is, it's not just the outside. These are literally, what is it, a seven inch diaphragm. It's a five inch voice goal, just absolutely huge. Um, Celestion actually approached Roy with this. They're, they're, they're friends, they're like, Roy, you gotta hear, you gotta hear this new driver. Roy's like, oh, bro, not another driver, so. I'm sure he hears that a lot. They were like, no, no, this is something special. So he tested it out and lo and behold, it was something special. Um, the biggest disadvantage of this particular driver is the dispersion drive, the coverage pattern. As you go up in frequency, it starts collapsing. Okay, so basically, at, if you just took that driver, bolted it up to a big ass horn, as you went up in frequency, it, it just it beams pretty good, which is fine for pro audio, fine for pro cinema, but when you're in the house, that's not so good. And so um, <clears throat> what I was trying to allude to the other day is that Roy's magic, his contribution is actually this little phase plug. It's like a 50 cent part. He didn't change the driver. They're just taking the driver and they're bolting it on. What they're doing though is taking this phase plug and it's a little, little square thing, it's about that big. It, it just bolts on to the front. So it's supposedly a convex design. If you look at it, all the fins are just straight up. It's, it's just several, several rings. So it's a pretty simple design, but very effective. Uh, like I mentioned the other day, it just, it makes the sound, just sound huge. So even if you're fairly close, it, it's spreading those high frequencies out. So snare drums, snare drums doesn't sound like it's coming from here, it sounds like it's just, it's huge. If you listen to a real snare drum, that attack, I mean, it's not coming from a little spot. That attack, you know, it, it's, all that energy is going to the floor, it's bouncing back up, it's a big column worth of energy. That's what that phase plug is helping you do. So it's, you know, these are gonna be, what, 35, 30, probably $38,000 speakers, and the magic is from a little 50 cent little part. So it's a lot of engineering, a lot of thought that goes into this, rather than just straight up throwing money at parts. So the interesting thing about that massive of a driver is that it has a roll off. And this is pretty typical among your pro audio type of drivers. 
they actually had to bring that up 15 dB. So, uh, you know, as you're going up in frequency, it's gonna roll off. They had to bring it up to get it that flat. That's just, but it, the driver is so tough, it can take it so they can get away with it. So, I, I believe I mentioned this the other day, but just in case I didn't, I, the other aspect about that face plug is that it, it helps the coverage pattern in general. So basically the old ones, you're looking at a 50 degree pattern. These are between 80 and 90, just, just much wider. What I didn't include is uh, the crossover slope. So what Roy likes to do nowadays is he takes the um, he, ta he takes his crossover magic and he combines it with uh, natural roll-off points of the drivers that he's using. So these in particular, the acoustic crossover on that horn is supposedly 340 hertz. What I didn't realize though, this is literally the steepest slope I've ever heard of. In result of, of doing that, it's 48 dB per octave. So uh, they, they started that probably with the Cornwalls, and, the, and basically the crossover, I think it's probably 12 dB per octave, but when they combine that with the natural roll-off, it ends up being either 18 or 24, to be honest, I forget. But these are at least twice that steep. I've, I've never, never heard of anything that steep before. So on to a couple of aspects with the bass band. Um, the new one is, is basically, this is a 20 hertz horn. Actually, it's like 19.6. And if you ask Roy if Paul was involved, he'd say something like 19.625. Like he'd go out as, as far as possible. I didn't think that was possible, to be honest. So I was, I was skeptical. Is some, of, some of the technology that they use in these, or some of the other subwoofers that use this technology, such as the KPT 1502. This thing is tuned to, you know, closer to 27 hertz. So what I was expecting, and I, I said this publicly, and Roy has given me some crap about it, but sorry, Roy. So basically, I expected strong 28, 30 hertz response. I expected it to, you know, roll off, but as some other subwoofer manufacturers do, they'll consider the room gain. So I had fully expected that if you took that, stuck it into a room, that the room gain would make it usable to 18 hertz. That's not the case. These are strong. The 3 dB down point is 18 hertz. That's nuts. What's especially nice, what, what begged my noodle, is that these really aren't that much bigger than the old ones. So, I, my feeble mind, I'm not a horn designer, I always thought that if you took a horn and you basically you wanted it to extend twice as low, the dang thing had to be twice as big, right? I mean, or at least significantly larger, but it, it, it's not really that case at all. It, it, it's all about the, the flare. The expansion rate of the horn is where the magic is. So that's way over my head, there's too much to get into, but that's how he was able to make these extend so much lower. Of course, and I mentioned this the other day, these are totally different than the new ones to begin with. So Roy, back in the late 90s, he was, thinking to himself, he was like, well, if we, you know, if we're gonna take a horn and we're gonna put it in front of a sealed uh, cabinet, then if that works pretty good, then why couldn't we bump up the efficiency even more by basically taking that horn and put it on a ported cabinet? But there's, that's kind of bending all of the known rules. There's no rule book. Um, there's no, you can't just punch that into a designer. Technology didn't exist. Laws of physics work totally different when you do that. So there's, there's been a lot of experimentation. So on the DSP itself, 
I, I've been I've been skeptical about the DSP mainly because you know we we did a lot of work with the Zilliqa with the XP 4080 things like that. Um, the biggest thing I run into is people wanting to experiment. You got to have to remember, and I, I'm not saying this in a condescending manner because Tommy Jacobs literally told the entire crowd this that we have to remember that we sell toys. We put smiles on people's face. They don't have to buy this. So, um, people like to tinker with their toys, is my point. And they like to get in, they like to change stuff up. So one problem in particular is that they like to mismatch amps. I don't particularly like that. I, I think you should just get a high quality amp and be done with it. But people have tried to take um, tube amps and put it on the top and basically take a you know, big fat solid state and put it on the bottom. I, I don't subscribe to that mentality. We really like the Cyrus Stereo 200. We carry those. Um, it's very clean. It's got a lot of power. It's you know, 180 watts or something like that, but that's really all you need. But what a lot of people do is like to mismatch. So this DSP helps you in that you don't have to use any adapters. The Zilliqa, it was a weird deal because to use RCA plugs, you basically had to get an XLR to RCA adapter. Then you had to go in and change some of the, the gain. With this new DSP, it, it's, it's quite a bit easier. First of all, it's already got RCA plugs and XLR plugs. Plus, it's, it's got two knobs on the front. You can independently change the gain of the HF versus the LF. But it's not completely foolproof as was demonstrated this week. So just as a mildly interesting story, it even tripped up Mark Casavan and Roy. So basically, they had everything set up. They thought everything was working good, they thought. So what happened was that somebody hit the switch on the DSP and it, I, I forget which way it was, but basically there's an XLR output there's, you know, balance versus unbalanced switch. Somebody hit that switch, the whole thing stopped working. So, um, interestingly enough, the same exact hap thing happened with the museum. They got a really nice Macintosh amp. Uh, they set it up right as you're going in. I think there's a pair of core balls hooked up to it. Brand new, beautiful Mac amp. So, they hook everything up, and they tried to fire it up, and lo and behold, it was absolutely dead. So, everybody's freaking out. Well, you know, there's a switch from balance versus unbalanced. Same thing happened here. So if that happens to you, don't totally freak out. Just, just be aware it hits a switch. So Jubilee Fest, um, I've mentioned in the other video that, you know, I've already got a lot of exposure to these things. So I've, part of that exposure is what was called Jubilee Fest. So this was basically a secret meeting of the minds. So there is a lot of old school hardcore fans that have really been into the, what's called the Underground Jubilees at this point. We were invited to go to Hope, listen to these things actually in the lab. And you know, it's two days worth of fellowship. That was the biggest thing everybody always looks forward to. But we got the first sneak peek at these things and you know we were able to listen to them in the lab with Roy was able to pick Roy's brain for two days straight it was quite a bit of fun I've got a whole bunch of pictures I'll try to get Jason to insert them um, just seeing the original fans and their reactions and, you know um, Mark Fragmento I, I overheard him tell Roy you know, I, I can't think of any disadvantage to these. Um, I, I expected some pushbacks. I wasn't sure what, but there was nothing but praise the whole time. Hopefully, we actually sent a video. We, after we listened to them, we went to the new field house for the museum. It was kind of a round table. We went around the room. Everybody talked about their experiences, what they thought. Absolutely everything was positive. So all of that was caught on camera. We sent it to Klipsch Corporate in the marketing. Hopefully you'll see some of that, see the light of day. Um, it, was, it was just very interesting. Because these guys, you have to understand, 
you know, one of the guys that was in the room was Mike Beasley. Mike was the original guy who put a Jubilee in his house. This was probably 2002, maybe 2003, give or take a year or two. So he's been there from the get-go. He actually approached Roy and wanted to put these things in his house. So he has seen absolutely everything. So, but every single guy in the room had a ton of exposure to the Oaklands. And it was, there wasn't a single negative comment ever. So. <laughs> So, as a, as a closing comment, I just want to say, please do not audition these things on a YouTube video. The, it, all of your advantages that you're going to get with the Jubilee, you cannot hear on a YouTube video. I don't care how good the microphones are. If you listen to these things on the cell phone, it's just absolutely defeating the purpose. I am sending a pair up to Jason you will be able to see Jason and Trey's, um, you know, expressions, reactions. They're going to talk about it just like everything else, assuming that we can get up the stairs um, into his studio. But I suspect at some point some other dealers or some other viewers are going to try to set up some microphones, get a high quality recording. And please just do not do that. <laughs> just, just don't, please. So interestingly enough, one of the demo songs that was played this week, we actually have permission from the artist to use. So, hey, we'll do it right now. We'll, we'll show you what it sounds like, but totally ignore it, please. Like I said, that is going to sound absolutely nothing like they do in person. So uh, we've actually got two demo pairs on order, both black and walnut. So please just show up to our uh, showroom, Paducah, Kentucky. We can show you what these things are supposed to sound like. I think Corey is convinced that the Jews are really good. I, I, I think he's convinced now. So that's a good thing, right, Corey? They sound okay. They sound okay. <laughs>